Welcome in the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for finding us on your favorite podcast app or on Dash Radio. Just download the Dash Radio app for free. Search for Nothing But Net. We're there every day, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Pacific. Also, I've got a new show on OnSideRadio.com, a new station based in South Florida, the only station that is locally owned, the only sports station in town that is locally owned. I'm on every day from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. We're having only five reasons guests. You can also check out the website onsideradio.com and you can search for the interviews and all of the other segments. Also, our YouTube channel at Five Reasons Sports has gone over 8,000 subscribers. A lot of that is due to my co-hosts today. So make sure you check out all of the streaming shows, and also all of the video breakdowns. Nobody's doing what we're doing there. Alfredo Arteaga has his new yard work up. Um, he does that every week, breaking down everything that happened in the past Dolphins game. So make sure you check that out. Also, the great sponsors of the Five Reason Sports Network, including Prize Picks. If you're tired of losing in fantasy sports, times are changing. Now it's just you versus the numbers. Prize Picks is the perfect place for you, whether the injury bug has ruined your season-long team or you're a seasoned vet in the daily fantasy space. On Prize Picks, you simply select two, three, or four players, and they don't have to be on the same team. You can choose them from different teams and just predict if they'll go over or under their fantasy projections. So they kind of do the work for you. Take a few minutes, say, okay, I like this guy's chances against this particular team, this particular matchup. Go over or I don't and go under so you can take the over the under and you can win real cash today prize picks gives you the chance to win 10 times your money for getting four predictions correct entries are so simple they can be made in less than 60 seconds so sign up today at prizepicks.com and here's the thing use the code five f-i-v-e to get a hundred percent match on your first deposit up to a hundred bucks that's the code five f-i-v-e to get a hundred percent match on your first deposit up to a hundred bucks Prize picks, truly daily fantasy simplified. And now, today's episode. One, two, three, four, five on the floor. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick with Alphonse Sidney, Alex Toledo, and Greg Sylvander. Part of the Five Reason Sports Network. All right, Ethan Skolnick back on five on the floor. We have been breaking down the Pat Riley press presser from last week. We took a little detour on the first one because we got into, you know, his comments about the Lakers, which have of course taken out of context and then made it through the media swirl and ended up being spit back out in a way that he didn't mean them. And so we addressed that Greg Sylvander and I did, but then we've also addressed the things he actually did say. And today's floor plan, I've got Alphon Sidney. It's just me and him today, me and Alf. And we're going to break down Riley's answer to my question, which was, how long do you want to do this? And the reason that I asked that question is because Pat always gives an answer at these particular press conferences, which he only does like once or twice a year now. And typically the answer has been I'm year to year or, or something along those lines. This was a little bit more definitive. And one of the reasons Alf and I are going to talk about this is because I think that we have to take this in the context that Pat Riley is going to be here for a long time. And then how does it affect the others who are in the front office? Because there's been some things that have come up the past week. So here was his answer to that particular question. Um, it's not the entire thing, but he says, as long as Mickey, of course, Mickey Harrison, the owner of the heat wants me to do it. If you guys will stop printing my age, Nobody will think I'm 75 years old. I love this. I love this team. I'm here as long as Mickey wants me here and Nick. And of course, that's Mickey's son, Nick Arison, who's running a lot of the day-to-day -day operations with the team. Alf, what was your perception, I guess, four or five years ago of how long Riley would stick around? Uh, um, my perception was that he would be here now. Um, I thought that you know, after the boss injuries, um, after Dwayne left, I thought he probably had a couple more years in them, try to put the team in a place where they maybe could succeed again, or they were on, at least on the path to success. As long as, as he felt that they were in a good place, uh, the cap situation was okay, the future was bright, they had some young stars, that he'd bow out pretty gracefully. Um, I think there's a couple of things that happened I think Dwayne coming back rejuvenated him in a sense that 
Dwayne coming back showed the rest of the league like it was it was a big hit to Heat culture when Dwayne came back and he just espoused how much he appreciated it here and how much he appreciated it more after he left and came back. And I feel like that re- repairing that um, relationship with Pat did a lot for Pat. Um, Because I think that was one of the the hardest hits that he's taken in his reputation. Um, I mean, in the last, you know, 25 or so years was that he let Dwayne Wade walk away and Dwayne Wade uh, was, you know, their relationship had soured. So the, the, the repairing of their relationship and the fact that Dwayne Wade became such an ambassador for heat culture. And I think that kind of put Pat Riley back on the map. And now the second thing is uh, Jimmy Butler and this, uh, this bubble run that they've gone on. Uh, Jimmy Butler just embodies everything he's ever tried to uh, instill in this organization. And I feel like for him, it has to feel so good. And why would you want to get off the ride right now, especially the way they've made a run in the bubble? Um, you you hear about guys like Oladipo putting the heat at the top of his list Uh, You hear guys like Jay Crowder uh, saying that he's so happy he's here. He never wants to leave. Andre Godala, who's been who's been playing for the Golden State Warriors, um, you know, one of the most respected vets in the league, can't say enough about your culture and everything. And then Jimmy Butler just puts up some of the greatest finals performances we've ever seen. You put all that together. Why would you want to leave? And I think that's kind of changed the math on things but at the end of the day he's still 75 years old right and i don't, don't think 75 don't say it don't i'm say sorry it. he's yeah. he's he's uh he's as old as our presidential candidates mm-hmm. and you know uh 20 years ago that's retirement age but i think it's kind of different now um i think people are working well into their 70s so we'll see but i think i think the math has changed when you talk about five six years ago to now you mentioned Jimmy Butler, and this wasn't a detour I planned to take, but one of the quotes that he had, and somebody, you know, snapped back at me on Twitter when I tweeted this out, like, oh, you know, that's a great quote. Like, who cares? But he tweeted, I love Jimmy Butler. And the reason I tweeted that quote when he said it, can you ever remember him saying, I love LeBron James? Nope. And I think that's what we're getting at here. Jimmy Butler, in a lot of ways, represents the second chance for Pat because the LeBron relationship, as I've discussed, never really developed into, I think what he thought it would. I, I, th- I think he thought that would be kind of the bookend to his career. He had the magic Johnson look he had a relation with Kareem, but really the strongest relationship was with magic. And he had that magic Johnson relationship. And then at the end of his career, he was going to have the LeBron James relationship, you know, the closest facsimile you could possibly find to magic, at least in terms of, size play style you know basically lebron playing point guard all that sort of stuff he was going to have that relationship and he didn't have it he didn't have it he didn't have it in part because he backed off and allowed eric to kind of run the show and try to build that relationship with lebron which took some time but in the second season together it kind of came together a little bit but he he wasn't i mean even with Dwayne, he coached Dwayne. he coached Dwayne for a championship he coached patrick ewing he coached alonzo morning he didn't coach LeBron. And at the very end, I remember asking him about their relationship and he said it was a texting relationship. His relationship with Jimmy is not a texting relationship. It's stronger than that. And even so, as, as Riley said, you know, I think what he likes about it here is we leave him alone, (laughs) right? Like he's not in his face all the time, but there is that respect. And and to me, the, the, the signature moment of, of that, of the, in terms of Riley, the signature moment of the playoffs in the bubble was Jimmy looking up at Pat, you know, yep. after I was, it was the Eastern conference finals, right. Looking up at Pat and Pat kind of, you know, shaking his arms like, yes, you know, and, and I feel like, I, I think you're right. I think the combination of repairing things with Dwayne, he couldn't have left things the way they were. Okay. And, and I, I always go back to the, the one very long conversation I've had with him, which was in his office after the after LeBron left a few months after. And I wasn't expecting him to torch LeBron during that, but he did. And he talked about, you know, the barbecues they were supposed to have and the generational team that got broken up. And he t- it was just great regret <clears throat> and also anger. Right. The combination of it. And then, like you mentioned, 
Bosch, who was kind of reminiscent of what happened with Zoe. So they had to go through that again. And then leading up to the Dwayne situation where you have the, the rancor with him in 15, which was direct between Riley and the agent, the late agent, Henry Thomas. And then so Riley and Henry stepped out of the way in 16 and nobody stepped in <laughs> and there was miscommunication and they never met and Dwayne was overseas. And then Dwayne leaves when he really didn't want to. And in part, everybody around Dwayne blamed Pat, okay, because Pat was the father figure. Pat was supposed to step in, and Pat didn't step in, and he has announced regret. And so I think, you know, then you see him have that's the offseason, but also 17, make the mistakes, the sentimental mistakes that he made during those two things. And, and what I got out of this presser was there's just such peace now. Like, I do feel like this run, let me ask you this. Do you feel that before this run, Pat Riley still had anything to prove in this market? No, not in this market. I, I <clears throat> as soon as he landed Jimmy Butler, I, I think there were doubts, right? Um, there were doubts, but then when when Dwayne came back and they they sent Dwayne out on such a high note, I'll say probably seventy five percent, eighty percent of the fan base was back to you know, uh, you know, Pat is the godfather, you know, greatest exec in the league. We love him to death. After he landed Jimmy for basically Josh Richardson and got rid of Hassan Whiteside, like, and he, and he basically in, in a godfather, uh, godfather style ending where, you know, he just takes out the heads of the five families in one off season. He kind of just, you know, just repaired his whole, he he repaired his reputation with a lot of Heat fans. So I don't even think going into the bubble, Heat, Heat fans were were happy. They're like, you got us Jimmy Butler. You got off all these bad contracts, especially when you talk about the trade deadline and you see Deion Waiters and James Johnson get out of here and you bring in two guys, uh, three guys who, uh, who can contribute to the team. Like, you know, you got to think that Heat fans looked at him and like, thank you, Pat. Like, it was almost like, thank you, Pat, you could go. Um, but then, and now, especially after this bubble, he has nothing to prove to anybody. But one thing, one thing that happens is, you know, when you're in a job and you start to get into this comfort zone and you've built something around you that almost kind of runs itself, like why walk away? You know, like why not just sit there and reap the, reap the fruits of, you know, all, all of your hard work, because I don't. And this is this is just me, you know. You know, I don't have it. I'm not you or Greg. I just feel like on the day to day operation side, I don't mm. think Pat has a lot to do with scouting. Uh, I don't think Pat has a lot to do with, you know, uh, salary cap uh, ma machinations uh, or the day to day coaching strategies. I feel like he has built, and this is a testament to him. This is not taking away from him. He has built such a structure around him that he can just basically mm -hmm. sit at the top of it and enjoy everything that's happening around them. And why would you walk away from that? And I guess that's kind of where I get the feeling from him. Like, man, I built all this. We just got to the Eastern conference finals. I'm not going to walk away from this. I want to be here when, you know, we're down Biscayne Boulevard in a year or two, or when we land Giannis, I want to be here for that. Like, and you can't blame that man for wanting that, wanting to see the fruits of his labor in real time, not from a, a, a vacation house in Malibu. Yeah, no doubt. And, and I do think the Jimmy thing, you're right. It's the trigger. I think the combination of the Jimmy trade and the white side purging. Okay. Those two things, which just cleanse the organization. Right. And then, you, you know, then he said in the off season, last off season, I let the culture slip. Right. And then you get rid of waiters and you get rid of James Johnson. Okay. And you may, and you get rid of justice. Cause let's be, let's be honest about this. Justice was not in sync with the organization over the past year plus. Okay. Before the trade. So you do those things. So you've cleansed the organization of what you believe are problems. And you've created this clear path after Jimmy has said he wants to be there. And as, as Pat said, like he said, the only thing he contributed to this run, now that's not really true, but he said the only thing he contributed to this run was a good meeting with Jimmy Butler. And he even said that they didn't even really have to sell Jimmy, that basically he was doing a sell job to Jimmy. And Jimmy was like, no, we're, good. He, we're, Ethan, good. we're good. Ethan, his here. presence at the top is a selling point. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to interview Jimmy Butler. He doesn't have to convince Jimmy Butler 
or even if he did, he could do it. You know, he still has that in him. But Pat Riley's presence at the top, almost as I don't want to call him a figurehead, but just just you know that just that presence here, you know, is always going to mean something. So yes, if he walks away, the structure he built will still remain intact because that's how strong it is. But it's always nice to have that man in that office with that wisdom that you can go and talk to. It's, I, I'm sure if he goes and retires off to Malibu, you can make a phone call. But if Jimmy Butler wants to have a conversation with Pat Riley, he can still go up to his office now. And I think I think for him and for, for the organization, that's still kind of important. It is. But see, this is, this is where I come down on this. And I will always say this and to the very end and to whenever it is that Pat does retire. The most we can talk about the bombast and you know the 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 fancy sayings and the books and all the, these other things that that Pat did the aura and all that. The most significant thing that he did to get this thing back on track it, it was not salary cap machinations working with Andy, it was not you know planning, it was not culture. The most important thing that Pat did was he showed humility, and here's why I say that. None of this happens unless he he acknowledges the mistake with Dwayne and repairs things with Dwayne. Yep. It all flows from that. OK, he had to show humility. He had to acknowledge he was wrong because I can tell you that Dwayne was raw on this. OK, raw and people around him were raw. They felt there were people close to Dwayne who said basically Pat Riley was his father figure. OK, and he failed him. He didn't reach out to him. He stayed out of the way. Pat had his reasons for that. And I, I mentioned one of the reasons was it didn't go so well in 2015. And so it was better to get out of the way. Okay. Allow, you know, this to be handled directly between the Arisons and between Dwayne. Okay. And it never really got there. Okay. And then of course you had two other teams in Chicago and Denver that were interested. Dwayne's feelings were hurt. He left her for Chicago for essentially the same money when he didn't want to go. I was there the day before he left. Okay. And he was miserable. Yep. <laughs> he didn't want to go. He had that he had but, that camp or but, something where he just looked like he was he had a camp like he wanted to cry the entire time. It looked it was so sad. He looked miserable. He, he was miserable. Everybody around him was miserable. They were planning press conferences, and it was like I, I was somebody close to him, I'm not gonna say who, but somebody close to him was like, We don't want to do this. They didn't want to do any of it, but they felt like they had no choice because he felt he had no choice. And we can argue whether that was true or whether it wasn't true and whether he overreacted to it. But the point is. You know, first, you had to have a stroke of good luck, right, which is that things he, that Chicago blows up, right? He and Jimmy are not happy with the young players in Chicago. Dwayne's image is tarnished in a basketball sense, in a locker room sense for really the first time, OK, because he spoke out there. In fact, he was on the other side of Rondo in that situation, although they became friendly after. And he and Jimmy couldn't didn't like the they didn't think the Chicago young players I mean, familiar story with Jimmy, right? Yep. They didn't think that he didn't think the Chicago young players had the right attitude, the Bobby Portises of the world, right? Some of the young guys that they had, that they had potential, but they weren't living up to it. And Dwayne was outspoken about it. He, he and Jimmy, and after a game, we've had Vinny Goodwill on to talk about that. He was there. He asked the questions and they were not happy. And so, so what happens? Okay. Well, obviously Jimmy gets traded. Okay. In Minnesota. Dwayne ends up in Cleveland of all places following LeBron stroke of good luck that that doesn't end up working out, even though Dwayne played really well off the bench for a period of time, but that mix wasn't working. Kobe Altman there is looking to make a change because he needs to make something happen around LeBron calls Andy. You mentioned Pat's not in the picture on this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Calls Andy and basically says, you know, they, he, Andy's doing his due diligence, just checking on players and Kobe Altman throws Dwayne at him. And then, Andy goes to Spo and tells him and, and Spo didn't believe it. I mean, didn't even think that's who he was talking about. And so you had to have all these strokes of good luck. But once they got the good luck, once Cleveland was willing to part with Dwayne Wade for a second round pick that they would never see a conditional pick just to kind of start clean. Then Pat had to show humility. And I think that's the thing with Riley that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, he is extraordinarily sentimental. And I, there is this, this attitude, there's this thing about him about being this hard ass. And it's funny because there was the same thing said about Jimmy Johnson. And with Jimmy Johnson, the sentimentality actually killed his coaching career because 
after his mother passed away, he came here to coach the Dolphins. He did not, it just wasn't in him anymore. He wasn't in him. That the Jimmy you saw in Dallas, how about them Cowboys was gone. Okay. And once he didn't get, once he couldn't deal with Marino, he checked out. Pat, though, Pat's sentimentality has led him to keep pushing. He's sentimental to this town. He's sentimental to this fan base. At times, to a fault, he's been sentimental to the players. He stayed with the 90s team too long, the Zoe Tim Mash team. He stayed with the 06 championship team a year too long. He obviously stayed with James Johnson and Dion Waiters and Hassan Whiteside and, uh, and that crew too long. But with Dwayne, he had to do it. He had to show humility. And once he showed humility with Dwayne, and that was repaired. Not only was it repaired, but he gave Dwayne the best send off any player has ever gotten. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. No, it's true. It, you know, it's and like it's 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 that schenectady. You know, it's 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 that it's that thing where uh, you know some of the hardest men that as that we've grown up around coaches, fathers, uncles. Um, we know them on the outside to be had this gruff, hard exterior, but we also know them to be super soft on the inside, right? Um, and he's just one of those guys who's always going to be that father figure type where he's going to give you a hard time, but you know he loves you. And that's where at one point him and Dwayne lost that connection. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I felt like the whole league felt it, right? Now he, it, it, he wasn't the father figure. He became the out of touch grandfather, right? You know, the, the, the guy, you know, the guy who's, uh, you know, upset with you for bringing the wrong person home for Thanksgiving. Like he was, <laughs> you know, you know, he was not, you know, he, he, he just seemed out of touch completely with today's player. And the thing is the greatest thing that's happened for him is that he got one of the best players of today that is one of his kind of players. Like Jimmy Butler could have played for the nineties Knicks. Yes. Yes. And fit yes. in seamlessly. Yes. Like, honestly, he would have gave Charles Oakley a run for his money. Yep. And now all of a Sox. sudden, yep. yep. And now all of a sudden there's this throwback idea to the fact that the way Jimmy Butler does things might be the right way to do them. And, you know, listen, it's everyone has their different ways. You know, the Lakers just won a championship, not doing things the heat's way. Right. It was a completely different – they have a Bill completely Jackson different won. style. Bill Jackson has rings on both hands and then some, doing things completely the opposite of Pat but, Riley. So it, but, it can be done different ways. Exactly. But Jimmy Butler has once again like brought to the forefront that the way that Pat Riley wants to do things is a way to win. And there are players out there who – I feel like there's, there's, a, there's, there's a Drew Holidays. There's a Jay Crowders. There's a Victor Oladipos. There's – guys out there who have been waiting to play in a situation that in a culture that's been cultivated like the one in Miami and that, that the one that Jimmy Butler has kind of just brought to the forefront and now Pat Riley's sitting in the middle of it as the architecture of this culture like why would I go anywhere so I understand why he doesn't want to move out the way but at the same time we what we can't what we what I will like to say about Pat is even if he's not moving out of the way as far as title, he has empowered so many people around him. Like, it's no longer the Pat Riley coaching tree. There's going to be a Pat Riley executive tree, right, <laughs> that, that, that goes around the league. Well, that's, that's actually – that's actually let's hold that because that's actually something I want to get to after the break because it's actually – it's interesting you talk about that, but it's also one of my concerns. So let's get to that after the break. I want, I want to follow on one other thing you said here you know, about, you know, this culture idea. And again, it, it being sort of proven that Pat's way has been the right way and guys yearning for this. Um, I, I think what's happened is Pat's created a situation where players feel they'll be maximized and, and that appeals to agents. And I think what, what has changed here is Pat's taken a much bigger role with agents over the years. Andy does a lot of it, but a lot of it is kind of explaining this you know, that we can get you to a certain place. We can get your player to a level he hasn't been. And so maybe it doesn't happen here. Like Derek Jones Jr. is an example. I don't think the Heat are going to pay him, but I think he might get paid somewhere else. And you can say that Derek's value has gone down because of what happened in the postseason, but Derek had no value when he came to the Heat. I mean, Phoenix let him go, right? So I think Pat can point to these guys and say, we can get more out of them. And then that player can go flourish either it's for us or for someone else. But getting back, cycling back to Jimmy again, that doesn't happen without repairing the relationship with Dwayne. 
Um, yep. Because if Dwayne was still saying the things about Pat that he was saying to me in direct messages in 2016, Jimmy's not coming. <laughs> He's not coming. I, I don't care how much he loves the, the idea of the culture because the stuff that was being sent at that point was about basically a feeling of disloyalty. Okay. A feeling of lack of appreciation, a feeling of this was all bogus. Okay. Things are being credits being taken for things that they shouldn't, shouldn't take credit for. That was the sentiment in 15 and 16. Now, Dwayne sort of fought through it in the 15, 16 season, but in 16, he'd had enough. And so, and the other thing you mentioned too, when you talk about how there was a perception of Pat being out of touch, it wasn't just the Dwayne thing. I mean, LeBron basically had four years of this and said, I don't want it anymore. And right? it, it was a league wide thing, I feel like. Right. Right. And, and then, you, like, then you had the Deion Waiters and the James Johnsons kind of trying to give voice to the fact that, no, this is the way to do this is a great way to do things. But I mean, how much how how much do their voices resonate? Well, the, the problem was how much does it resonate? But also then there was the overreaction to it where you end up taking care of those guys because they're saying nice things. And and that became problematic. I mean, here's the whole thing about it. And then after the break, we're going to get into kind of where they go from here. And, and as you mentioned, the rest of the front office. The thing about it is a Pat Riley organization should never beg, right? Like, right. If, like if, I, I mean, let's, let's flip it. I mean, if, if you are the most eligible bachelor, okay, like you shouldn't be begging someone to be with you. You just, you let it stand on your own. Okay. All right. And if the person wants to be with you, they're with you. And if they don't want to be with you, you move on to the next one. And that is the way that the Heat have typically operated. Okay, we're going to make a run at this person. doesn't work out. We'll go somewhere else. They, got, they, they, they felt desperate in they 16 were begging, and 17. They were begging. It felt like they were begging Gordon Hayward. Right. I mean, look back at that now. And I understand Gordon got hurt. I understand. And Gordon was a top 20 player, okay, before when the Heat were recruiting him. But he wasn't a top 10 player. And they treated him like he was a top 10 player. I mean, they went all out for this player. If he hadn't gotten hurt, was Gordon Hayward the piece that was going to change your culture back? Probably not, no, right? Not right? at all. And, and, so, and the thing is, now they're at the point where they, they can choose the right type of player for their culture, where before they were taking – and they, this is one of the biggest differences I've seen, is that they were taking players that didn't fit their culture and molding them into their culture, but that only lasts so long, right? It did. It lasted four years with LeBron. It lasted like a year and a half with Deion Waiters. It lasted like six months with Hassan Whiteside. Like, it does uh, – you you know, Jay Crowder, if if they want to – Jay Crowder is the kind of guy who could – who wants to do the work and he'll do the work forever. Right. It's, it's almost like, it's funny. And it, as someone I used to coach uh, youth basketball, like it's almost this like repudiation of AAU culture yeah. that's happening right now with a lot with, and I feel like there's a lot of players out there in this league that are done with the Carl Anthony Townses of the world mm -hmm. that have just grown up so coddled. And like the coaching staff has to coddle them, the executives had to coddle them, and they're just sick of it. And they, like now, those players all want to come play for the Miami Heat, so the Heat can hand pick the kind of guys that fit their culture instead of you know. And I don't want. I, I it sounds bad, but going into the trash heap and pulling guys out and trying to mold them into what you want them to be. It's, it's just funny, never going to work. It's never going to last. It's funny you mention that because Eric Spolster has just out of nowhere started going on anti AAU rants like during during his zoom calls in the playoffs and it was like it didn't even have anything to do with the topic at times and and once uh he was talking about bam and one of the reasons they liked him so much was he wasn't an AAU guy and bam was an AAU guy actually he's not the typical one but he played AAU ball and it was a little bit weird that it was coming out of nowhere from him but this has been an organizational shift and philosophy and uh, you know, what's funny about it is I know that there's a perception that that's LeBron, right? But LeBron doesn't like AAU culture either. I've had conversations with him about it. And you know who else hated it? Kobe. Kobe, you say, Kobe did uh, many interviews, okay, before he retired about what was going on in AAU and he didn't like it. And it's so horrible. I do – I, well, I do think there's something to it. I do think there's something to it. And I think, and Jimmy is the anti AAU player, like in every possible way. He's yep. had nothing handed to him. He wasn't highly recruited. He had to go to junior college, right? Okay. I, he, in every conceivable way, he's anti AAU. And I do think in some ways 
that's a little bit of a shift. I mean, I mean, Zoe played AAU, didn't he? I mean, like, I, I feel like the Heat have been okay with AAU before. Um, but playing AAU and being and 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 actually, uh, you know, and being part of that culture are two different things. My son played AAU ball, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't mean he was an AAU kid. You know, it's, right, it's, right, there's right. a difference. There's there's a there's a you know there's these AAU all star teams where these guys just hop around and they're, you know, they play no defense. They're treated like the, you know, the cock of the walk it's, and like, I listen, I'm, and I'm not going to be, you know, I don't want to sit here and like denigrate young black men trying to make, you know, but there's, there's, there's a, there's a culture to AAU that it just, it does, does not fit with the Jimmy Butler's of the world. You know what I mean? So I think I, I, that's what like when I say that there is a repudiation of that culture going on in the league right now. The guys who want to work mm. and versus the guys who have had things handed to them, like and I, I see it happening, and it's really cool. Like there's a Drew Holiday's that guys idolize, mm. and the rest of us look around like, what are Drew Drew Holiday's numbers? They're not that impressive. But when you have to play against that kind of dog, those are the kind of guys that the Heat want, and that's. It's, it's cool to see that a team full of those kinds of dogs made it all the way to the NBA finals. And yeah, I, like, why, like I said, that's Pat Riley. Yeah. And it's why it's, it's why Jimmy, it's why uh, Eric kept using that phrase. I do want to get to the one possible downside though, of everything we're talking about. We're going to do that after the break. Do you need a realtor who will treat you as a valued client and not just another commission? Let me recommend you consult Eric Brown. And here's the website. This couldn't be easier for you. Five reasons realtor.com. So after you check out five reasons sports.com, check out five reasons realtor.com. It's spelled out F I V E, the official realtor of the Five Reasons Sports Network. Eric's a real estate professional with several years of experience representing celebrities, executives, and pro athletes, but also first time home buyers. And he's got a Wharton School business education. So he's uniquely qualified at identifying property value, negotiating on your behalf and providing an unmatched level of service. So if you're considering selling or buying a home in South Florida, or just want to know what your property is worth and what is still remarkably during COVID, a strong real estate market, contact Eric at 305-967-9089. That's 305-967-9089 or go to fivereasonsrealtor.com. If he can't help you, he'll recommend someone who can. So find out what his specialized professional business approach can do for you today. Eric Brown at fivereasonsrealtor.com, the official realtor of the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, we're recording this episode on a Wednesday, but I'm not exactly sure when we're going to post it because we've recorded a few this week and we want to make sure we get them out to people. But today there was some news. And so I, I, th- I want to put this in a little bit of a different context. As our guy, George Sedano said on five on the floor, what, four months ago when Daryl Morey was still in Houston, <laughs> that Daryl yeah. would probably be the next general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers. A little scary. I want to, I kind of want the lotto numbers from George. Well, George nailed that. He nailed D'Antoni getting fired. I mean, there's, there's some stuff, you know, George and Brady Hawk need to just like, you know, do one of well, those yeah. uh, Saturday shows on 560 where they do uh, picks. Does Brady and, does Brady have time to do that when he's posting? I don't know. With, uh, listen, Brady has time for everything, apparently. Apparently. I don't know. Is he still going to school? I'm not sure. I got child labor laws that I'm violating. I need to, we need to check his grades before he writes another article. <laughs> like, I, I really, I, do, I worry about his grades. Like, what is he doing? So, I'm not being held responsible for that. Check out all his stories <laughs> on the website. But one of the things uh, that, that, comes into context here is and again a little bit of inside baseball tom haberstrow um when he was covering the heat we've had tom here on the pod he's now at nba nbc sports.com but he was one of the heat index during the big three years he moved down here um great tom's a great guy sort of a numbers guy developed relationships with people inside the heat organization he he developed a very very close relationship with shane battier Okay, a lot of mutual respect there. Shane, of course, believes in the analytics, believes in the numbers, and they would talk for like 20 minutes after games. Like, if you wanted to get Shane after a game, get him before Tom got there, okay? Because he and Cooper Moorhead would be sitting there with Shane for 25 minutes, breaking stuff down, okay? Tom, as soon as the Moray thing happened in Philadelphia, Tom posted, watch Shane Battier to the Sixers because – Everybody knows yep. Shane and Daryl Morey are very close. Um, Morey was the general manager in Houston. Their relationship went well beyond basketball. Morey is kind of adult hinky, I guess. Like 
you know, mm-hmm. Pinky got blown out in Philadelphia. Morey, you know, you and, you and I have our criticisms of Daryl Morey. And as you've talked about kind of running the credit card up and whether some of the ath- analytics stuff that he does is really real. But the reality is he's more experienced at the job than Hinky and, and the Rockets have had success. I mean, they haven't won the, the ultimate thing, but they've had success. And so here's where I come back to Pat on this. We have seen this off season. You talk about creating a structure. And when I spoke to Riley about this in 2015, he talked about the front office that was built and that he didn't have to do as much that he had Andy. Uh, he had at that time, I don't think Shane had come in yet, but he had, he had Andy he had Adam Simon. He had Chet camera who's still around, even though he's not officially he doesn't have the official title. He used to have, he had Nick, he had Mickey, he had Zoe, he had this, this group. Okay. Um, in a certain way, he had a cabinet of rivals, right? Like what you wish, like the president actually had um, to actually challenge him on things. And, and, you know, there, and he gave credit to certain people in the organization for finding Whiteside, for drafting Josh Richardson, et cetera. Okay. So he created this structure and then Shane came into it. And then of course, Eric has warranted more power and control and influence. Okay. Because of what he's accomplished. So you've created this incredible structure. And one of the things I've always said about the heat under Riley is that it's like hotel California. Nobody ever leaves. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and when people used to leave, like Jeff Bizdelic left, it didn't go over so well. Okay. Mm-hmm. So very few people have actually left the organization. What's happened this off season. Adam Simon was like attractive to what it was named as like a finalist for like what two jobs this time. I mean, it's like three or four total at this point. On the coaching staff, Dan Craig and Chris Quinn interviewed with Indiana, and Craig ended up taking an assistant job with the Clippers um, for what I heard was a little bit more money and maybe a clearer path to a head coaching job. And here's the only thing I wonder as we're talking about Shane. The fact that Spolster is so entrenched in the coaching job now, to me, is one of the reasons Dan Craig's not here anymore because even though they're like best friends (laughs) – there was no, there's nowhere to go, right? Because I mm-hmm. thought at one point Spo might move to the front office entirely and leave the coaching. There were people inside the organization who thought he was going to do this after his first child was born, okay? Because he's been on the road a damn long time, okay? I mean, he looks young. He's been at this for two and a half decades, right? Okay, so there's really no upward mobility on the coaching staff anymore, right? And as long as Pat's in charge, even if, as you say, it's more of a he's more than a figurehead. But even if it's just more as the top of the masthead, the one making final decisions, then nobody else is at the top. Right. I mean, other than the guys who pay his salary, Mickey and Nick. But I'm talking about the personnel uh, managers. And the reality is, and he's as he said, he's fused at the hip with Andy. Okay, there's no jealousy or anything there. But but you've got you've got Andy who could run his own organization right now. Clearly. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got Adam Simon who could run his own organization right now. There are other organizations who think they can run his or their organization. Okay. You've got Shane Battier who could run his own organization. Wasn't he, I think Detroit looked at him, right. And he's from Detroit. They looked at him last year. Okay. So you've got all of those guys. You've got Zoe who could probably have a bigger role in another organization. Okay, but yeah, Udonis has him coming if he retires. You got Udonis has him. You've got potentially Chris Bosch. Who knows if he wants to get involved? Okay. Gary Payton so, wants to come back. I mean, you, so uh, this know. is what I'm saying. Like you've created this incredible culture that people want to come to and they want to stay at. But if the two people at the top, okay, and again, Mickey and Nick is that's sort of off to the side because they're ownership. Okay, but if the two other people at the top are Pat and Eric, and they're not going anywhere for the next five years aren't you worried about losing talent, like a talent drain? Because we've seen that with New England, right, in the NBA. We've seen that to a certain degree in the NFL. I'm sorry. We've seen that with San Antonio in, in, uh, in the NBA. That yeah, but you can't, you can't run your people off. You can't run your organization like that. Like, I, I will tell you, and this is way, 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 way lower level than what the Miami Heat are doing, right? When I was in my early 20s, I ran a Taco Bell. I was a general manager for Taco Bell in the middle of the hood. That's a whole other story. I have some, I have great stories about my times as a general manager of Taco Bell. But um, I remember when I got to, when I was at, you know, championship level, I had three outstanding assistant managers and I started taking all these kids from the time they were 16 and making them shift managers and, you know, boom, boom, boom. I had this pipeline 
So every time the entire South Florida region needed an assistant manager, I'd give them one of mine and promote one of my shift managers. Mm -hmm. And I just had this pipeline constantly, constantly. And if you're running a good organization, you will always have a consistent pipeline, right? So you don't ever worry about the fact that you're holding back somebody's uh, 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 forward movement. You know, when David Fisdale gets an opportunity, you say, go ahead, David, we got, not to say that you're not unique, but we have another bunch of guys that we believe in as well because we've cultivated this, this pipeline that we're constantly bringing in guys and we're, we're teaching them heat culture or we're identifying, not just teaching them heat culture. First, you're identifying talent. You cultivate that talent and you're not worried about losing those people because you know you can do it again. Pat mm -hmm. Riley's been doing this since 1995 and, and Eric Spolster has been here this whole time. One thing, and, and so one of the things like when you talk about some of the guys who left in the past and it kind of soured, that, those are the kind of things I don't like to hear because if you have confidence in your organization, you're always glad to see people go. Like when Jawan Howard got the head coach job, head coaching job at the University of Michigan, I feel like the entire Heat organization, the Heat fan base were happy for him. They were. Dan Craig, I'm hoping that everybody's happy for him because if you believe in your organization, if you believe in your culture and you believe in the way you do things, like you know that that pipeline will create another Dan Craig. It might not be the same guy as Dan Craig, but you can identify enough talent in that person. And you, you know that your culture can, you can input your culture in that person where you're not going to miss a beat. It's almost I like a factory. You know, you just, you keep producing these things. So it's, if you're confident in what you can do and, and who you are, like this should never be an issue. Right? And you should, you should keep pumping out execs, right? You should, you should keep, you should keep passing execs on to other teams. And then you, you did people turn around and look and just say, I want to go work for Eric Spolstra because one day I can have a head coaching job. Well, and that's where you'll get the best talent. I think it is a little, and well, it's, it's actually what we're trying to do with five reasons. I mean, we've lost good people and you know, we, we find, you know, I mean, we've lost good people and then we find the next Brady Hawk. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and once Brady turns 18, then he might be too old for us and we'll have to find another one. But, I, but, but I'm with you on that. I, but I also look back to what happened with the dolphins under Shula. And one of the things that happened was of course, when Jimmy came in in 96, he wanted all his own people. But part of the issue was that there was no successor to Shuler shula anywhere in the dolphin organization it was just don okay and so i do give pat credit for developing so many people underneath him i think that is a different thing here but i think and we're gonna when we come back from this break we're gonna do one more quick break and then i want to i want to get to the key question here and we'll finish with that but i i think that that one of the things that that has to be considered here is over time pat i think has to he's empowered a lot he has to empower even more um i, I just think that and I'm not saying he hasn't done it, but I think there's another level you can even get to because somebody's got to be ready to take this thing over. And right now, I don't know who that is because there are so many qualified candidates in house and it's going to come from in house. But I don't know which of them is going to get picked off before they have an opportunity to get to the top. Like to me, Shane, in a lot of ways, seemed like the natural person and was being groomed. But he may not still be here. And in some ways, I think Adam could do it. Adam Simon could do it uh, as well. But I don't know that he's still going to be here. So I just wonder, I think what's happened with, with the, those under Riley and under Spolstra is that because they know they're in a good thing and they know the heater run correctly, they won't take bad jobs. Okay? Yeah. So they're not going to take a job that has no hope. Now, Fisdale went to Memphis. At the time, that was a good job. OK, it didn't work out because he had the issues with Gasol. Now, we went to the Knicks after that, but that's a job removed. OK, there were people in the heat organization said, don't take that job. But that's a job removed. When he went to Memphis, it's a good job. Dan Craig going to the Clippers with all that talent, a chance to grow on his own. You know, it's lateral, but it's not it's not a terrible move. He's going to a team that should compete for a championship. OK, and he'll he'll get different voices, different influences. And I think that's part of his decision. I also think in some ways it's good for Eric Spolster to lose people. I think if a coach yes. has the same assistance, right? If you have the same people in here, particularly someone 
Fizdale was his best friend. Dan Craig was his best friend. Those were the two guys who sat next to him on the plane. Okay. Sometimes you need a different voice to sit next to you on the plane. <laughs> you know, you definitely do. You know, and, and so I, I think there's value to that potentially. Um, I think as he's as Spolster in particular has kind of now groomed Anthony Carter and Malik Allen and of course Chris Quinn. Um, and we'll see maybe Gary Payton is an option. Um, he has expressed an, a desire to coach. Maybe it's UD. Um, maybe it's somebody that that we're not thinking of right now, and and you know that they'll they'll mine another talent. Maybe it'll be somebody out of the G League, okay? Because they have a lot of contacts there too. So it could be any of a variety. It could be Eric Glass gets a bigger role. He was tremendous in the summer league. They have options, but sometimes you do need uh, different voices, and so I think that's that part of it's okay. The Riley thing. The only thing that concerns me is about this. Look, Pat has earned the right to stay as long as he wants. But if he stays another five years, he stays another six years, he takes another seven years, Adam Simon and Shane Battier are not going to be here at the end of that. Okay. And they'll, they'll have another, they'll have another guy. Right. And well, one, the, right. And here's what I here's one thing I will say. You talk about Shula, the Heat will never hire a Jimmy Johnson. No. It, they'll never have to go find a hot coach. No. The hot coach will be on their bench because a hot coach every year. Is the you know every year the hot coach or the hot assistant coach is being interviewed, the hot exec that's being interviewed is coming from the Heat's front office or from the Heat's bench. Right. So if Eric Spoelstra just, and that's the thing with it, when you when you talk about who's going to take over for, for Pat Riley, he's sitting on the Heat's bench right now in a head coaching position. Right. Well, it could be him, and then I always thought that it would be you know Fizdale or then Jawan or then Dan Craig, who might or Chris replace Quinn. Spoh. They, they, they got the guy. Like that's the thing. That's why I was. I. I don't. They're never going to be the guy. Like, and it worked out for the Lakers. Mm -hmm. But the Heat are never going to hire Frank Vogel. No, no, no. Like, no. have they ever no, done no. it? You, 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 well, the question is on that bench. Is Chris would? Let's say Eric decides. Uh, and I don't want to go too far on this tangent. But let's say Eric decides in a year. You know, he's got two kids now. He he's tired of the grind. I don't think he 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 was re-energized this year. So I don't think that's going to happen. But let's just say in a year or two. Who's the guy on there? Is it Chris Quinn now? I mean, Chris Quinn got a look in Indiana. I mean, he's uh, respected. I mean, maybe he's the guy. Okay, potentially. Maybe Eric Glass is the guy as as he continues to ascend. Or they bring back Fizdale. Uh, or you could bring back Fizz. Right. That's. True. Or you tell Juwan Howard, you want an NBA coaching gig? Like, right. Th right. That's that. Th like whoever whoever takes over for Eric Spoelstra or Pat Riley one day is going to be a homegrown individual, and they're going to carry the culture forward. That's the difference between. Shula getting replaced by Jimmy mm -hmm. and what's whatever's going to happen because Pat Riley got replaced twice. Yes. And both times it was, it was somebody within the heat organization. Yeah. Shula when he got replaced re himself twice. Right. Exactly. Yeah, right. He exactly. Shula got replaced by the hot coaching candidate and it, it, you know, it just, it was a different, it was a whole different vibe. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting conversation though, because, uh, you know, as we talk, who knows, by the time we post this pod, it's possible that we're already hearing about, you know, Philadelphia reaching out to Shane. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Um, I know he loves living down here, but, you know, obviously, <laughs> you know, if you get but again, in if even if he went to Philadelphia, even if they move Elton Brand out, remember, Brandon and Battier played together in college. <laughs> There's a relationship there. Um, but even if they moved Brand out. Shane wouldn't be number one there. That's going to be Daryl Morey's show. So I guess that's the thing is there's no organization for Shane to run right now. If there is an organization for him to run, it could be a different conversation. I got one more question uh, for you. We're going to do this in one minute when we come back from the break. Before we do, I want to tell you about one of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. That's Biscayne Bay Brewing, the official craft beer of Inner Miami, the Miami Marlins, and us. This is South Florida's actual independent brewery. Biscayne Bay is owned by local guys who employ people in this community to make their beer right here in South Florida. These guys are committed to our community and supporting five reasons sports. So we can keep bringing you all the local sports content that you can handle. If you care about supporting local business and drinking amazing beer, grab their stuff. Marlins lager, Miami pale ale, tropical Bay IPA at all major retailers throughout South Florida. It's the only beer we're drinking at five reasons sports. All right. Last question for you minute or less. How does it, how does it end for Riley? Um, I think it ends for Riley either with a championship um, or a whale. And so I, I, I think it's going to be, you know, he's going to walk away when there's a starting lineup of Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero, and Bradley Beal. 
and Jay Crowder. I don't know, somebody else, Paul Millsap. I don't know who else. When you name the first four, who cares about it? Who else is on the team? Um, I think it's going to end with a whale. And that's what, I think that's what he wants to, he wants to either walk away with a title or he wants to walk away with a, you know, a, basically a title in hand. But, you know, the more I talk about it, if he, if he brings in Giannis, he's not going to leave until he gets well, the ring. Well, that's the thing, right? Yeah. There's always, there's I think it, another reason. It ends, it ends with a title, right? I think it ends with a title. Um, it ends with a title and a bright future. You know, uh, 2013, he probably thought there was a bright future and he wanted to ride that wave. Um, but, you know, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, so I think if he, if, you know, he brings in a Giannis, he brings in Beal, he brings in, you know, whoever, and they're able to win a title. I think that's when he rides off into the sunset. I think the hardest thing for him will be once they get the whale, it's like you said, then every team, unless you're in a bubble and you have the strange circumstances you had this year, every team has a growth period, right? Every team, even that heat team, that, that big three heat team, had a growth period, nine and eight, and then losing to Dallas in the finals. And I just wonder how many years he would stick around for that. Okay, so you get the guy, you have the program built, you get to the conference finals, you get to the finals. If he has one of those situations that he's had over the course of his career, whether it was, you know, again, we can go to the Knicks against the Bulls all those years, or again, the 90s Heat teams, you know, that, that kept beating their head against the wall, um, or even, you know, the, the, the Shaq team that didn't get there the first year, right? If he has a situation like that, where it's first couple years and they're getting close, getting close, getting close, that's where it's going to be a pivot point where I'm like, okay, does he walk away then, right? Or does he just keep trying over and over? But you're right, he doesn't seem in a particular hurry. Nobody in his, I don't know. It doesn't seem like his his wife is pulling him away um, in, in I in any significant way that's kind of forcing him out. Mickey's not going to push him out. So I, to me, it's you know, I, it's indefinite. It's indefinite. I mean, he they may not win a t- they may get the whale. He's not going to quit when he gets the whale. He's going to see it through, and then it's like, okay, do you win the championship the first year? Maybe he'd walk away. But most teams don't. So if they don't, then two years, three years, um, who knows? But he's earned the right to finish it. Um, and I do think it's it's gratif- must be gratifying for him because a year and a half ago, you know, everybody, Riley's washed, Tyler Hero, what are you doing? And it, things look totally different now. All right, check out all the sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. Biscayne Bay Brewing, prizepicks.com, use the code five of course our other spot five reasons realtor.com for sure and of course our other sponsors like you break wheel fix.com safe cubbies.com my bookie.ag we appreciate all of you we'll be back with you soon thank you for listening to the five on the floor on the five reasons sports network one two three four five on the floor five.